Yeah, I started my video early and then ended it because I picked up a fish against my better judgment. I knew I shouldn't have done that, but I picked up a fish and um, now my hand stinks like dead fish, which I'm sure will last for a day or two. But I was just curious, you know, and what do we got to lose? It's not like I have some important meeting or have to give a massage where I don't want someone thinking my hand smells like dead fish. But, um, tis what it is. <laughs> um, I, last night, I prepped my video. I did, like, lighting checks. I arranged a good scenario and everything beforehand, like, it was ready. One thing I didn't foresee, one of the dramas here was they had turned off the Wi-Fi without talking to us for whatever reason they lied about. And what I didn't foresee was that they turned the Wi-Fi back on last night and I had had my Wi-Fi on because I was hotspotting from my phone to my other phone while I was uploading all those videos to YouTube. And uh, so last night's transmission didn't go through because the Wi-Fi here sucks. Um, I mean, it works, but it works very slowly, so it was not good for streaming. Uh, yeah, I hadn't eaten any, like, food besides peanuts and fruit for three days. I kept meaning to, I just wasn't really getting out to do so. So today I went and had some steak. The sahol. Um, with some... It was nice. It was good. Really well put together. I ate with my Italian friend Marco, who I've been teaching every morning. And uh, I wish I could do this in such a way that you could see. Oh yeah, right? You kind of see the sea that way. Um, I didn't sleep super well last night. That's okay. Anyway, so yesterday I was very happy with, uh, with the teaching I gave and then like nobody was able to see it so I felt kind of bummed out about it. Um, and today again I was just very tired so thank you. Yeah, tonight, tonight I'm coming through fine because I'm just on cellular. It was the Wi-Fi that was killing yesterday's transmission. Um, again, on cellular here it's, it's fast and clear usually. Um, but the only place I have unlimited data regularly is Facebook. Uh, unless I pay for it, which I can do for two hours, unlimited internet for 66 cents, 15 pesos. Um, I wish I had a dream to tell you or a story to tell you. Does anybody want to hear any stories? Do you have any? I'm not feeling inspired, so I just have to have the screen on for a little bit. You can ask. Dominic, tell us more about that Qigong thing. That's an idea. Um, I talked to a friend yesterday that I hadn't spoken to in a few years, maybe. Um, and he was telling me this story of how at one point in his life, he had had this l perfect living situation. And he's kind of somebody I regard as a high level wizard. I mean, he has, researched like every type of spirituality you can imagine and I wouldn't say he stayed on the surface of it I would say he got deep into it and obsessed over it and learned a whole bunch Hola, hola Dave uh, Si, sono bien, esta bien, si 
Anyway, so this friend, he's a, he's a high level wizard, I would say. So I was calling to ask him about, has he ever led anybody in a past life regression? And how exactly does he, do you do Reiki attunements? Because he attuned me 20 years ago. Um, and I gave a few attunements the first couple of years. I was doing Reiki, Reiki, Reiki all the time. But when I started doing massage as my main source of income, I always put Reiki in the massage but I never uh, would just do a whole Reiki session. You know, after my first year of being Reiki attuned, I was doing Reiki all the time. Uh, I just made it a, a part, I folded it into my sessions. So these guys that I'm teaching Qigong to, they asked if I could give them a Reiki attunement. And I was like, oh, I'm sure I can. And I, and I thought about like, how did I do it back then? What was the formula? And it was fun to call him and you know, he asked me what my situation was, where in the world was I, what was going on? Uh, we've known each other for over 20 years, so he knows that I'm always traveling. And I described my situation and he was like, oh, so it sounds like you won the quarantine lottery too. And I was like, the quarantine lottery? I mentioned that to Marco today. He was like, yeah, one of my friends in Italy said that. Oh, you must have made some good decisions at some point to end up there during this point in reality. I always think it's a slippery slope to take events personally. Um, but he told me this nice story about how he tried to cling to this perfect living situation and he cr created this incredibly elaborate ritual and he'd done this once before. He had this perfect living situation. So he did this elaborate ritual so it wouldn't change. And a week later, he had to move out. And it happened again. The exact same thing happened. He was in this amazing living situation and he's like, I don't want this to ever change. I want to somehow just cement myself in this situation they did this amazing ritual and a week later they were like oh yeah we're selling the house you have to move um, and this was all like this all happened I guess in February so they're like yeah you're gonna have to leave at the end of February and so he started talking to his friends and he had some friends who had uh, a place out in the country outside of Portland um, and they said, oh, you can come and stay with us for a little while, you know, during your transition period until you find a new place to live, because it was all rather sudden. And then, of course, the world went into lockdown. He also makes his money a lot of the time doing massage work. So, like so many of us, he can't make money, but he's at a beautiful place in the country. He can do all of his practices. Like, he leads them in chants every evening. They're friends. Uh, they have a long history from an uh, esoteric magic system of hermeticism, different branches. So it's nice that he's like living in the woods. He gets to do ritual with people who understand him and relate to him uh, on a regular basis. And uh, we all have different versions of our quarantine lottery. One of my friends signed on recently and I was telling somebody about his house that like he'd had this house for 30 years. It's a beautiful house, nice little house in the country. And he'd never really spent longer than a long weekend there. Um, and after having this house for 35 years or something, he had. He'd done work on it, certainly, but he never really, like, hugely renovated it. And uh, they did a huge renovation over the winter. And then all of a sudden, the quarantine lottery, you know, like, oh, um, very fortunate, fortunate. What good luck that they decided to do that this year. Everything just aligned um, so that they had a beautiful place to be, to be safe, to, and everything was new and fresh and you know, gorgeous. Just how they would want it if they had to live there. Having never really been there more than three or four days at a time, now they're there for a month or indefinitely. A friend I know from Italy um, who speaks five languages and works as a tour guide, tour director, I think is more the word. Uh, because he speaks five languages, he can get a lot of work in Rome, giving tours to people. Um, but obviously that's not going to happen. There's not going to be tourism in Italy for a while. <laughs> he said there was an announcement today that um, things on the path for things getting back to normal, tourism might start again May of 2021 in, in Italy, maybe. Um, so, you know, he'd only been doing that for six years, but he'd gotten really custom to this thing where in the summer he would go to Italy and he'd stay with his mom in this port side town and busloads of people would come off the uh, cruise ships and go into Rome and he could 
give gigantic tours because he spoke five languages and he made tons of money and then in the uh, autumn he would just start traveling the world. Yeah, see Joseph, I don't really have to be talking or teaching, right? I can just point the camera at the ocean. I do that a lot in the sunrises or recently I'm just like, I don't need to say anything. I sometimes sing a little or give a little like positive intention. But it's just like, just look at the sea. I'm thinking about leaving here. I've, I've paid up here until the end of this week. And I'm thinking about leaving here at the end of this week because the uh, people who are managing it are passive aggressive. Normal monsters, you know, people are monsters. They're normal monsters. They're not like excessively bad. They just lie and manipulate and passive aggressively make me feel bad. I'm in this beautiful place but there's this passive aggressive garbage going on here. So I'm like, you know, maybe I should go stay somewhere else. But it's really hard for anywhere to compare with this view and the fact that I can walk up to the meditation circle so I can actually walk. I don't have to worry about, uh, I, there's nature, there's birds, there's iguanas, there's lizards everywhere. Um, seems like a silly idea to leave. And my intuition often tells me to stay, stay, stay. But I think I'll head back to America soon. America's a nice place to be, right? Um, anyway, I was telling you about my friend in Italy, so he just, he's not going to be able to make money doing the tour guide thing for a year or two, not in Italy, maybe somewhere else. He can speak five languages. But again, tourism, as we know it, is probably not going to kick back into full swing for a couple of years, I imagine. So I know a lot of people who work in the tourist industry, and that's just not what they're going to be doing for a while. Um, so one of the things he's doing is he's teaching Spanish classes through Skype right now. Um, and he's invited me to do it two times, so I like paid my extra money today so I had unlimited internet so I could do the Skype meeting with him. Um, and it was really nice in that uh, I felt like I spoke Spanish better than most of the people in the class, which was nice. Uh, but certainly, like, he was like, one of the problems I have with him as a friend is that he likes saying denigrating and cruel things. Yeah, that's just some people's style. His, like, friend was talking about something, and he's like, but she's a slut. But she was saying, you know, he was like, what do you guys want to do? You know, when you get out of isolation, we're going to come up with some Spanish sentences. What do you want to do? And, like, the first thing she said was, yo quiero chupa polla. Polla. He, you know, everybody laughed, or no, most of them didn't understand it, and then there was, she had to try to explain in Spanish to the others what she was meaning. Um, but somebody was like, I can't understand them, they're all just speaking in Spanish really well, and he's like, don't worry, they're saying everything wrong. And one of the things he was criticizing about me, of course, was my accent, that when I studied Spanish in high school, and like when I do Duolingo, I guess Duolingo is somewhat Castilian, but I don't use the Castilian accent. I'm using more of the Spanish accent, or the Latin American accent. Um, and the Castilian accent is very different. It's different as the British accent is from the American accent, which of course are many different American and many different British accents. Um, but it was, you know, he, he's just like, don't worry, they're saying everything wrong. And there's a whole bunch of words I don't know when speaking Spanish. So one of the stories I was telling today to Marco was that like, when I was, talking to this woman. Oh, hey, Joseph, I'm in um, Oaxaca, which is on the southern coast of Mexico, Pacific Ocean side, uh, in a town kind of near Puerto Escondido. <gasps> Hola, Harry. Harry, um, is there, I know, I think the accent uh, in Barcelona is similar to the Castilian accent, right? You know the subtleties much more than me. I'm sure it's totally different. I was just talking about taking a Spanish class with a bunch of friends from Italy. And one of them was from Poland. One of them was from Istanbul. One of them was from Germ or Serbia. Although the girl from Istanbul and the girl from Serbia was living in Ber they were both living in Berlin. Uh, another was a girl from Palermo who was staying with her parents in the mountains near Enna, which is near the center of Sicily. Um, is there somebody else? But it was just, it was super fun to try to speak with all of them and the different ways we were trying to speak Spanish, the words we knew, the words we didn't. And again, just connecting with a totally, like his, his group of friends, his world is like, let's go out dancing every night. Let's go to the disco, let's party. He's not someone who does drugs. 
Like, he doesn't drink alcohol, he doesn't smoke cigarettes. He's a food addict, he's a big chubby bear, as I like. But like his friend, he was like, oh, if I got into any of those drugs or alcohol, I'd just be dead, because I just, I can't stop myself, you know, the way he eats. Um, so he doesn't do drugs, but a lot of his friends are drug people or sex people. Like, you know, the, the girl from Assembles, they were like, what's your job? We were t trying to say to each other, you know, que es tu trabajo ocupada? Uh, es, no, soy un uh, masaje. Uh, I know I never got him to explain to me how to say that. But we, we, I don't, and I didn't hear the word that he was trying to tell her how to tell somebody you're a stripper. Um, but it was all like these countercultural, weird, artisty, world travely. Um, Yo quiero vino y cocaine. You know, at this point in my life, I've been sober for a few years. So, but you know, I remember the days of wanting drugs. I remember the days a masajista, a ma masajista. Estoy no soy un ma masajista. And uh, Harry, if I were a male masajista, would I be a masajisto? I believe in Italian it's massaggiatore, which I was like. It's interesting to be hanging out with this Italian kid here because he's, after having been studying Italian for um, two years, and then hanging out with this Italian kid here, and we're both trying to learn Spanish. Uh, and I'm trying to put my head back into Spanish, even though I studied a bit in school. Uh, much like I've often criticized about American English, soy masajista men and women gracias juntos seis, sexos por se. but the difference between like uh, American English and British English like British English it still functions a lot like American English but there's a lot more like internal rhyme idioms that we don't use in American English and there's a lot more subtleties and like depths of vocabulary that the average American just doesn't use um, that I don't know about the average British person using, but a lot of British people use like a much wider swath of words because they're not, um, even though it's, it's, I was just going to say, because England wasn't colonized. And of course, England was colonized by multiple races of people over history. Um, but uh, different, you know, not in the most recent waves of colonialism. And so Spanish, you know, it made me think, I was like, what did the people in the Iberian Peninsula speak before the Roman Empire, like, forced them to speak some weird version of Latin that turned into what we now call Spanish? Um, and the complexity of Italian versus, like, the relatively simplified version of that same language, structure, family in Spanish, it was, it's just so interesting to be able to see the way the the languages d uh, develop differently because obviously what we call Italian now is not what they spoke in ancient Rome but the the structure of how the language works is very different um, and I know that uh, Spanish in Spain is a whole bunch of I think it's like 40% Arabic I've heard uh, not to mention the Basque words that have bled into the culture and um, Catalonian is famous for being another language or another dialect. Some people would burp, burp, burp about that. Um, but I remember when I was there that a lot of people would say merci or mercy and uh, ciao. They would put in a lot of words from other languages around that were different than what the standard Spanish or an Andalusian Spanish or Castile y um, It was just fun to, you know, I've been here interacting with people very little, being in teacher mode, and in the last two weeks doing these videos. I guess in the last two weeks being in teacher mode and doing these videos. Um, it's, it's kind of a one-way. Very, there's very little actual interaction here. It's like monologuing and a, try to be useful. Today I'm not trying to be useful. I'm kind of tired and I just ate and I'm kind of bleary. I'm just being a guy. It's being like hanging out. Hey guys, what's up? Hang out with these world traveler people. What do you like to do? Me gusto leer. I like to read. Me gusto escrito. Escribir. No, es, escribir. Escribir. 
me gusta escribir, me gusta enseñar, me gusta ver, mirar, escuchar, hablar, bailar. God, musica. And I was kind of laughing over the, how the word tomar, like, what do you want to drink? I was like, why isn't it bevar? Tomar? Tomar can also be like to take, to push, to take, to give, to, to carry, to touch, to play. These words that can mean a thousand other things. So the experience that I've had with these live videos, like last night I went through them, did a little bit of editing. I edited out most of this part of a lot of the videos where I just was talking uh, one of my friends for a long time. You know, we have different types of friends. And uh, one of my friends for a long time, I've known him since 1997, I think. Um, he sometimes just makes bitchy, derisive comments on the things. Um, thank you, Michael. Uh, and so I was giving a very, I, thought, I felt a very specific talk about traveling. Somebody had asked me to give a talk about traveling. And he, he made a bitchy comment about how it was just extem extemporaneous. Um, and I think in the live videos, the extemporaneous talking is kind of nice because again, it's me connecting with people when I'm isolated and we're in isolation. And it's also just trying to share a little bit of what I have here. So just telling a little story about some, you know, that's what a lot of people like nowadays. Any kind of movie or entertainment is being able to. I'm just lazy and tired, Kyle. Or maybe I'm always contemplative. Oh my God. Um, but anyway, when I was editing through these videos and I was like splitting up some things and cutting out some stuff, I, uh, I was listening to the audio quality of a lot of these recordings and I find the ones that I'm close to the phone and talking, my voice is fine, it's clear, you can hear me, you can still hear the waves. Um, like in this one, uh, as you noticed a couple days ago when I did a talk, you couldn't see my face because I, I wanted to show the background. I've, I've done a couple talks where I just wanted to show the background because it's so beautiful but you couldn't see my face, which was fine. Cause I was like, I'm trying to impart some information. It doesn't really matter who I am, what I look like. So I would like be on the side of the screen and just try to let you see the beauty. Um, but I've noticed in the videos where I'm standing away from the camera and trying to teach some, something where, you want, where I want you to see my whole body. It's just really hard to hear me clearly. Um, and I've been experimenting with different apps to live stream, being able to use the Bluetooth mic earbud things, and I just don't think um, I can do it. And I find that if I pay for this, for the unlimited internet, I can upload videos really quickly to YouTube, even if they're a gigabyte or whatever YouTube compresses them into. Uh, hour long videos I can upload in 15 minutes or something. So the next time I do a yoga class, um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to shoot it in an external app, pre-record it. I probably won't do a lot of editing or add in. Um, yeah, thank you, Joseph. Good. Yeah, you, you can imagine we're sitting around and having a beer, or drinking some wine or drinking some magic uh, potions. I've been making tinctures here of herbs because, of course, when the whole plague scenario er er erupted, um, Oh, that's kind of a nice story. I might tell that. But when the um, when the plague scenario erupted, uh, I met a girl who was an herbalist, and she had a bunch of tinctures. And one of them I looked at. I'd never heard of the plant, but it said it was specifically good for respiratory problems, bronchitis, fever, uh, and it was antiviral, antibacterial. And I was like, "Well, golly, this sounds like the right herb to be introduced to right now." <laughs> and I went into town and, and talked to an old herbalist lady at a market and bought some from her, and looked through the trash and found an old uh, whiskey bottle and 
went into town to a grocery store and bought mezcal for 15 cents, which is what it cost me to use the unlimited internet. So it's like 66 cents, 15 pesos, 66 cents, two bottles, 15 pesos each, and poured them in the whiskey bottle and I macerated the herbs. So I broke it up into little pieces and shoved it in the bottle. So now I've made this whole bottle of tincture and I made a tincture of chaparral as well, La Gobernadora, um, because they're both very strongly antiviral. And when I felt like I had COVID, I took them and it really helped. And I thought, okay, well, what happens if everybody in this town gets sick and they start, you know, there's breathing problems and there's not a hospital here and there's not ventilators and they need someone and I can show up and be like, I have the medicine, you can use some. We all have egoist situations. That didn't happen. So now I just have a lot of tinctures and maybe I'll just give them to the herbalist girl when I leave town, whenever I leave town. Go back to traveling in the new world of traveling where you just can't get from place to place in public transport because it's all been shut down and there's no one traveling. I'll have to find somebody who's like, hey, I have this old van if you want it, which has happened to me a few times. Do you want my van? You can have my van if you want it. And I'll be like, oh, thanks. And I'll drive around America and visit people and teach them Qigong and yoga and herbalism and we'll make salves together. I'll go visit Michael in uh, uh, Florida and then stay with the cassowary guys. <laughs> we'll all <laughs> survive our COVID together. Um, Harry, I am in Mexico, in southern Mexico, uh, in the state of Oaxaca, on the Pacific coast, near a town called Puerto Escondido, that was a big tourist destination that has now become a tourist nightmare, but not as bad as Cancun or Acapulco. Um, this town has not become a tourist nightmare, so, what a lot of people say here is they don't want you to say the name on the internet. So it's very like a radical fairy sanctuary. They're like, we want zero internet presence, so don't say the name. And I've noticed that other people who have been here, when I see them blog about it on Facebook, they never say the name of the town. So I'm trying to respect that and stick with that. Um, I found out about it like four months ago. I got a ride back from Indiana to New York from some guy I hadn't seen in 14 years. And he told me the story about coming down to this area with some other guy who had told him about it last year. And in telling me about it, he mentioned, oh, there's this weird little hippie town that's got a nude beach next door. We went there one day and I was like, fuck your hippie town. I want to go to the town with a nude beach. Um, so I have, my quarantine lottery winnings have been a hippie town with a nude beach. Now it does have some dark energy. The translation of the name from the ancient language is the beach of death. And uh, a lot of people die in the waves here all the time. Remember when Taylor Mac came to uh, Barcelona and I was trying to get you to go see a show. He did a show that was on Broadway last year that unfortunately did not do a great job, but it got on Broadway and it had famous people in it. That was nice. Um, but it was inspired by his first visit here because he walked out of his hotel one morning to go to the water's edge and there was a dead body rolling around in the surf. People die here a lot because the currents are really intense. People get drunk. There's a lot of drug culture here. Um, the hippies founded this town. The locals didn't live here because it was called the Beach of Death. And one of the theories was that perhaps um, it's because the current killed so many people. And one of the theories was that because of the riptides that swirl through this place, the ancient people would bring the dead bodies of their family down here and just push them into the sea and let the sea take them away. Regardless, I'm staying at the beach of death. Um, there's some spirally negative energy here. Like a week before I arrived in early February, some dude got shot on the main street because he was involved on the wrong side of some drug thing. You know, a lot of people talk about the cartels here, like the mafia. So this is not a big cartel area, um, but there is some cartel presence here. And so, some dude got shot on the street right before I arrived. But again, he was a Mexican dude who was on somebody else's turf and wasn't respecting, you know, whatever gang warfare. I'm not doing drugs at this point in my life. And, uh, various points in my life I've stopped doing drugs, or legal and, and illegal. Um, but one of the things that I always appreciate about not doing drugs is eliminating that whole level of anxiety and tension related to, what if somebody finds out? What if I piss somebody off? What if I get caught? What if somebody gives me bunk at? Whatever. It's just nice to not have that at all. Uh, but I get asked, well, not right now because we're in lockdown mode, but when the town was active, I got asked every day if I wanted drugs. Every day I walked downtown, people, the 
there were guys selling coconuts on the beach, so it was a really good, uh, what do you call it, ruse, where they would be like, coco, coco, quieres coco, o cocaine, quieres cocaine, and if you'd be like, did you ask if I want cocaine, they would say, oh no, do you want a coconut? <laughs> anyway, uh, and so, so a friend of mine from Mexico City, he was like, oh yeah, there's a lot of meth down there, you know, whatever, there's meth everywhere, there's drugs everywhere. Good to see you, Harry. We can sit and do a portrait if you want, but we'd have to do it on Facebook Live where I have unlimited data. And I can just sit on Facebook Live and you can tell me what to do and what not to do. If you want to do a portrait. I don't know if you're still doing that project. It'd be fun. Um, or I can pay the two hours unlimited internet thing and do it any, any way you like. FaceTime, Skype, whatever. Um, I was gonna say something about the pandemic story. Right, so when I left, so last year I did this project of spending time with my parents to see if I could do it without getting triggered and getting angry and getting upset and feel trapped and hating, because hating Indiana, because I didn't want to hate Indiana. I don't want to hate anything anymore. If I can get that out of my heart and mind, I don't want to hate anything if I can avoid it or if I can just not do it, not waste my energy hating things. Um, so I spent four months with my family last year and I felt like it was a tremendous success. I had such a good time being with them and any time that I started hating Indiana or whatever event that was happening, I would just stop it, turn it off and get back to a place of appreciation and kindness and gratitude. I was like, it's, you know, it's miraculous. Any of you who are unhappy with your own mind and heart, understand that you can change it. You can change the habits of your mind and heart. Not forever, you're still gonna think hateful, stupid, mean things, but you can really, really nip a lot of those in the bud. Like as soon as they start, instead of feeding them and turning them into monsters, you can just be like, oh, I don't like feeling hateful and horrible. I'm not gonna feed that. Yes, the ocean does sound lovely and it wakes me up every morning. It plays all day. It's the stereo. I sometimes put music on for a few minutes and then I just turn it off and listen to the ocean. So anyway, I got back to New York the day before New Year's, and I think I found out about COVID-19, we didn't call it that back then, when I was your age, I don't know, like on the 2nd or 3rd of January or something, it was really early, um, and I remember my first impression was like, oh, that sucks, but I remember SARS being a big deal, and SARS didn't really ever affect me, it never directly affected my life, I mean, there was some talk about it, some anxiety, but I never ended up being in an area where it was a problem, even though I was in New York City. Um, I just remember SARS not being an issue for me, although I, it may have gotten its way around the whole of culture because I do remember shortly after that, that I got a cough that just stayed in my lungs for like two months. And it wasn't a bad cough, it was just like <clears throat> a few times a day. But like, for two months after the cold passed. Um, you know, these dry cough things. Uh, and I think I got that a couple times over the last decade. I don't know if that was SARS or what the fuck that was, but I remember when I first heard about this COVID thing being like, oh, well, that's just, it's just gonna be like SARS. However, the friend I was staying with uh, is a shaman. He's a city shaman. He's lived in the city his whole life and he is, traveled and taken workshops in the desert with people who te teach shaman stuff. So you know, shaman can mean a whole bunch of things and there's cultural appropriation shamanism and there's uh, shamanism lineages and there's good and bad things about all these things. Again, it's just like such a weird word. Like some people say it comes from Siberia, and the tree climbers and some people, there's a lot of evidence that shows it comes from India. But doesn't everything come from India? Uh, but it's applied a lot to Native American and Aboriginal cultural rituals about earth magic. So it's like, why don't you just call them pagans? And pagans like an earth worshiper. Isn't that what that word means? Animism and stuff like that. But anyway, shamanism is what it's called. He's a city dude. He's lived in cities his whole life. Um, so he's a city shaman. He has relationships with nature in a, we in a weird way that is very different than me because I grew up in farmland. And farmland is in nature. Um, but it was much more accessible to me and I fantasized about nature and you know, developed 
very intimate relationships with nature, although I'm not somebody who can live in the forest without anything. I don't think I could be on one of those survivor shows. People are like, oh, you should go do that. I don't have those kind of skills. But maybe I could develop them, and maybe anyone could. Point being, he did a shaman class about death. This is the year of death, 2020. I can see clearly it's the year of death. Maybe it's the decade of death. We'll find out. We're all learning about being at peace with death. Death is cool. Hey, dude, we should go die someday. Hey, we're all going to die today. Let's die another day. Anyway, um, he was doing this shamanistic class about death, and somebody had canceled, and I was there, and I think I had a client that day who had also canceled, so I was like, can I just be a part of your class? I'd like to see how you teach. Um, there is a word that I learned from a Stephen King novel, though I don't remember now which one it was, but the word is psychopomp, and I don't remember what culture psychopomp comes from. It's probably a Greek something word. But uh, my last name is Polish for ugly owls, and owls are famous psychopomps. Um, a lot of psychopomps are related to birds, blackbirds, dark birds, nocturnal night birds. And in various cultures, the idea of the psychopomp is when you die, um, it's a being that helps your spirit get from this world to the other world. So it's kind of a catalyst. It's like uh, Charon, you know, who took that little piece of money from you and rode you in his raft across the river Styx into Hades. You know that story. I guess he was a psychopomp, right? Uh, but so I've always, since I learned about the word psychopomp, I always thought it was cool. And then when I learned that my last name means of the owls, I was like, I'm a psychopomp. That's just something I naturally do. And I've done it many times. And one of the shamanistic things that I had, that I felt called to learn when I was younger and was introduced to the idea of shamanism, but more from like a Norse. I, I first heard of the story of shamanism from the story of Odin and how he tied himself to the Yggdrasil tree. I don't know if that's how it's spoken, how it's said. I read it and that's the way I've always thought of it being pronounced. And hung himself for like 28 days upside down by his foot and the Futhark was revealed to him, which was their writing system and magic system and so on and so forth. Shamanism, to me, that's what it meant, this idea of climbing trees, starving yourself, and getting mystical visions and um, having magic revealed to you. Um, so I felt like it was very important for me to learn how to die and come back. Very important for me to learn how to walk into the other world. It's been interesting hanging out with this Italian guy because he talks a lot about these obsessions he has with like learning how to astral project or master the world and become immortal and never die. And I've like, I used to be obsessed about that kind of stuff and I feel like I've let go of all that because I'm just like at this point, life is out of my hands. I don't feel like I can control anything. And one of the things I keep telling him, I was like, the universe, life, reality has rules and laws and they're real and some people care about them and some people don't, but it doesn't matter. You have to adhere to them on some level or another. And some people like us can obsess over about learning about all those rules so you can manipulate them, control them, and exploit them, uh, get past them, as it were. Uh, and, and, and there's that idea, of course, of wizards that if you learn the rules of how reality works, then you can bend them. You can start shaping reality. But what I've perceived in my short life and from studying history and reading books um, is reality ends all the time. The world ends all the time and new worlds are happening all the time. And the way that that translates into what I'm talking about is the laws and rules of the world change. So as soon as you figured out how to master and manipulate and live by or live past the rules of existence, they're going to change again because everything's changing all the time. Um, That was a little derivation, sorry about that. So it was really important for me to learn these kind of things and I was really obsessed with somehow figuring out how to manipulate reality, rewrite the rules of, I wanted to be an author of reality and uh, I didn't want to write a book. I wanted to be the author of reality, but a lot of authors have taught me that that's what they're doing and, um, and they're also not doing that and you can't do it and that's what you do a million ways to do that it doesn't matter because reality is changing all the time and everybody kind of lives in a different world anyway 
But we're doing this psychopomp workshop. Well, a death workshop, and one of the things we were practicing was psychopomp. And we drew up a list of things that we wanted to help transition. Areas we knew there were suffering, and like one of them was somebody who had recently died of a drug overdose, like find his spirit, because it may be traumatized and lost between realms, and see if we could help it. Um, one of them was thinking about the Australian fires and all of the plant spirits and animal spirits that were freaking the fuck out and traumatized and might not know how to get to where they were going and maybe they could use some help, not to mention all the people who were caught in that. Uh, I don't know what the death toll of humans were in that, though. Humans. I don't know if humans are more important than trees and animals, kangaroos and koalas and cassowaries. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that we did, or that we talked about that was on the list, was going to Wuhan, because Wuhan had just gone into lockdown because of the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. And so that's the first place we went. We all kind of, as a group, well, he, the, the teacher drummed, he used his shaman drum and he drummed, and we um, traveled together to Wuhan. And so imagine it like a group hallucination that you're doing in a sober way with your heart and mind and will. And, you know, we were going into that space to witness it, explore it, and see if we could help energy transition. So we were working with the humans that were dying, but we were also working with all the humans that were terrified in fear to help them transmute that fear, release it. Um, but it was, you know, it, this is not something that one tries to do every day. And doing it in a group, the power's stronger. And even if you're someone who's just like, well, whatever, you were just imagining like kids playing, like you're doing cowboys and Indians, and you were just pretending that you traveled across the world and went to some city in China you've never been to, and whatever. But it was a very powerful experience. Um, it was terrifying. The energy when we landed there was horrible. And what's interesting about it is it's so similar to the lockdown feeling that um, even that I've experienced here, um, but like when I talked to my friend in New York who was leading the workshop who didn't um, go with us, he was holding the drum, so he didn't go with us. He didn't see what we saw. He didn't feel what we thought. But all of us agreed with how it felt and what we saw, which was interesting. Um, but he's told me stories about how New York feels right now. And it's like, one of the stories he told me recently was he was like, yeah, I went out into the park and I sat to take in a little bit of sun and breathe in some fresh air. And there were two homeless guys. One was just kind of crazy talking to himself and then singing songs. And the other was digging through a trash can. And then he like paused and he's like, yeah, you know, New York's always had a lot of homeless people, but right now there's hardly anyone else outside. So the homeless people are just, they're the only ones you see. So imagine if you've ever been to New York, seeing that gigantic city empty with homeless people roaming around. Like the jewel of weird imper or imperialist, materialist, uh, wealthy people and spending money and being elegant and artistic and rah, 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 rah. And it's just the homeless people that are out on the streets now. Um, with all of their fear and anxiety and disease and hopelessness and craziness and countercultural weirdness. Just like imagine what New that, that version of New York City is like, right? So that's kind of what it felt like to go to Wuhan. And uh, I did some overall work with transforming the energy in the city itself, if I remember correctly. Uh, the city as a, as a being because I, I, you can think of anything as a being, the tree as a being, the ocean as a being, the mountain as a being, the city as a being, and all the human life within it. The levels of energy underneath it, in the middle and above it. Um, but at one point I was like, oh, this is China. There's gotta be people who are doing Tai Chi and Qigong in the parks. And I, I don't know if they can do that on lockdown, if they're still allowed to get together, because again, I didn't know anything about lockdowns. Um, and so I specifically kind of set out to find people doing Tai Chi and Qigong 
And I did. I found some people doing Tai Chi and Qi Gong. I kind of like tuned into that energy. And then I trans, uh, I transferred, I created a central channel and gave them tons of energy and supported them and created what I knew from the five element system to create a uh, healing energy around them to support them. Um, And it felt really good later to read reports of convalescent hospitals where the doctors were leading the patients recovering from COVID and, and Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, that's one of the realities that's been happening in China with, uh, regardless of the truth of what they're reporting or not. That's one of the stories. Hmm. Hello, Bob. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Bill. Hello, Bill. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Bob. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Christopher. <laughs> Hello, Joe. We only skip. Hello, Jamie. Hello, Nick. Hello, Lauren. Hello, Clifford. Hello, Joseph. Hello, Richard. <laughs> out and talk a little bit. Let me look at my beach through my screen here. Hello, Sam.
sorry about that. Oh no. You're welcome, Michael. Yeah, it's just a... Uh, it's really amazing to live right by the sea. I've never been right by the sea before like this, for this long. Two months right by the sea. I think I'm gonna stay here until May, I don't know. I like the idea of staying here until like early May and just see what's happening with the world. There's this idea that, or I had an idea that by then something will have transformed a bit. There's enough stuff that's moving. We're definitely transitioning, but, oh, here, let me lift this up a tiny bit. Felt like that cloud should be included a little better. Thank you for your work, Glenn. Good night, sleep well. Skip. There's going to be so much transition going on. Um, I think the um, it's so nice. Just look at that. going to be a year of transition. You're welcome, Mark. Yes, I enjoy talking and telling stories, but it's also nice to just be quiet and let the ocean do the talking. Uh, are any of you able to broadcast this to your television? Do you have any setups where you can just send this out to your TV? Because I know from YouTube you can like Chromecast. I don't know if you can do that with Facebook Live, like while you're watching it, I'll put it to your TV.
I'm gonna look at something really quick. I hope this doesn't cut me off.
Hi, Tony. Love you. I'm sitting here transferring handmade toothpaste into my travel toothpaste tube. Mixing it with my old mix of toothpaste. We're watching the sunset. Allora, abbastanza per stasera, sì. Ok, todos, te amo todos. No, sanamos, ustedes amos, no lo so.
los osos de Tera, los osos del de mundo, los wolves. Aquí está el lag, el ping, no sé. Buenas tardes, buenas noches de la playa de la muerte con amor. Hasta luego. Ciao.